Mr. Beast released a video on Sunday where he's drilling 100 wells in Africa to bring safe drinking water to struggling communities. I watched it with my daughters, we donated to his fundraising, link in description. I shared the video around and was ecstatic Jimmy stepped into the safe water cause and got tens of millions of people interested in it. Yet, because he's Mr. Beast and he can't afford to have even one second of wasted time in his content, he may have left important sections of the story out of his video. So here are six points which I believe deserve additional attention starting with this moment where we get a close-up of a pump his team installed. As of today, there are an estimated 300,000 abandoned pumps in Africa, representing $5 billion in wasted investment. And the blame goes greatly to the NGOs who installed them for two reasons. First, many Western world charities have a domestic purchasing policy, which they use as an argument to collect donations. For instance, until 2006, the US Agency for International Development's website proudly boasted how the principal beneficiary of America's foreign assistance programs had always been the United States. It even goes beyond. For long, US law required US aid to use American contractors for most development works. As a result, 80% of the contracts and grants went directly to American firms. You may wonder, what's wrong with that? After all, it sounds like a clever use of a virtual cycle you support your local economy while doing good. But here's the catch. Even the best piece of American furniture will eventually break at some point in time. And when local communities need to repair, they will also have to import spare parts from America as they don't use the same standards than in the US, which will become an unbearable cost. And as a result, the pump will be abandoned. In his video, Mr. Beast boldly claims that this thing can basically pump non-stop for 30 years. Statistics and studies say something else. The average pump deployed in Sub-Saharan Africa lasts less than five years, for the spare parts reason I just mentioned, but not only. The second part of the story is that maintenance is a skill that requires a knowledge transfer, another step that often goes missing in the approach where a foreign body comes and installs a turnkey solution. It's all about giving the local community a sense of ownership over the newly installed infrastructure, along with the tools and knowledge to care for it over time. Looking at Mr. Beast's footage of the pump his team installed frame by frame, my gut feeling is that it's not your average pump. It clearly looks like a tier 1 piece of furniture, which shall come with a solid expected lifetime. Clear kudos to them for that. Yet, when pump aids, specially designed elephant pump and blue pump claim a 15 years expected lifetime, I'd still believe Jimmy's very optimistic with his 30 years. Where Mr. Beast hits the nail on its head, though, is when he highlights how dramatic the risks associated with bad water are. He's got a very elegant way to explain how these children's lives are being limited and sometimes cut short from being forced to drink unsafe water. By the numbers and according to UNICEF, 3.5 million people lose their lives every year because of a lack of access to safe drinking water and that's an aggravated risk for children under 5. All year long, every 86 seconds, a child under the five dies from one of these said waterborne diseases. To even figure out humanity's fine with that is beyond my understanding. As the video shows with the highly turbid and colored water found in the river next to the school in Kenya, the main risk doesn't lie in the brown taint, but in the bacteria, especially the coliforms, which are found inside. These bacteria stem and develop from waters which are contaminated with sewage and fecal matter, something that's pretty common as 3.6 billion people around the globe still lack access to adequate sanitation, often in the same places where safe drinking water goes missing. And anyways, raw surface water is unfortunately nearly never drinkable anywhere around the globe. Hence, Mr. B this approach to drilling wells in underground aquifers is the absolute right thing to do. But several times across the video, Jimmy mentions the unlimited clean water that's provided to local communities. Access to unlimited clean drinking water. Uh, basically, it's unlimited amount of water for this entire village. Well, I see what he means by that. But that's not really true. There are two types of underground aquifers. Fossil ones that a little like an oil deposit exist and would be an untapped resource until someone drills into them. 
and renewable ones that are somewhat connected to surface water and replenished within the water cycle. In the case of a fossil aquifer, the misused word by Jimmy would be unlimited. These water bodies clearly are not unlimited and we're too strongly tapping into and relying upon these nowadays. As proof of that overtapping, satellite observations of Earth demonstrated a change in the planet's gravity field induced by the fact that we're displacing large quantities of water, hence also weight, when we over exploit them. The biggest problem here is that eventually these resources will run dry and we will have to look for water elsewhere. Now, in the case of Mr. Beast's project, I doubt it would be fossil aquifers. Sub-Saharan Africa has mighty rivers, very strong seasonal rain events, and high replenishment rates, so I would believe those underground water bodies to be connected to the surface one and hence renewed. So Jimmy's right, it's unlimited water, but is it safe? That's a question of depth and velocities. The reason why groundwater is of better quality than surface water is that Earth is running a filtration on surface water as it percolates through layers of sediments. That's efficient in removing many problematic contaminants and is actually the natural version of the sand filters we're using in water treatment plants. That's where depth first plays a role. The closer you are to the surface, the less Earth has room to do its part and clean the water from fecal matter and nitrates. But even if you go deeper, if you dig too many wells in the same aquifer, you may still risk steeply increasing the velocity of water flowing through the layers of Earth, which also means that the contact time between these filtering layers and contaminated water reduces, eventually up to a point where cleaning is not sufficient anymore. Not to mention that some contaminants would still need additional treatment to be removed, as deeper aquifers often have heavy metals or minerals in too high concentrations, but I'm pretty sure Jimmy's team would have run the quality analysis to ensure Sure that's not too much of a risk where they drilled. So bottom line, unlimited safe water doesn't exist. I would believe the unlimited part to be almost true in that region, yet the safe is an aspect to closely monitor. One thing, Mr. Beast is incredibly right though, and I really praise his work to make it visual in the video, is that collecting water when you don't have safe and reliable access to it takes a lot of time and effort in a day which places a terrible burden on local communities and especially women. In the video, Jimmy takes the walk across the mountain with the school kids, a journey they have to do twice a day, every day, to collect water. Depending on how remote your area is and where the actual source of water is located, that task can take several hours in a day and up to half of the day. Let's state the obvious. That's a time when populations don't do anything else, like work or education, but also an additional health risk, as Jimmy shows with the heavy loads it represents to carry two water containers over a mountain. And what if you can't afford to spend two hours a day to go collect water that's even of questionable quality? Well, you can instead go for tanker water, a service that's often offered in urban and suburban areas in sub-Saharan Africa. Yet the catch is that water delivered that way is on average 10 to 15 times more expensive than tap water, leading some of the poorest people on earth to spend 20% of their income on water. For reference, if you're blessed like me to be a resident of an OECD country, you're spending around 0.5% of your income on tap water. Relatively speaking, that's 40 times less. Summing up all these burdens, the time spent collecting water and not a truly productive task, the additional health risk, the absurd price premium that shows how expensive it is to be poor, you obtain what the founders of water.org defined as the coping costs of water. And every year around the world, the amount of money people pour into this coping cost is 300 billion dollars. Wanna hear another absurd number here? The United Nations estimate it would cost 116 billion dollars a year to provide everybody on earth with safe drinking water and reliable sanitation. Yet we still prefer to let the poorest people on the planet spend $300 billion a year instead. Crazy, stupid, and a great thank to Mr. Beast for making that absurdity so visual.
Something Jimmy didn't get quite right though is the order of magnitude. Opening the video, he explains how these 100 wells are going to give around half a million people fresh water to drink. Later on, he's even more explicit as to how much water can this provide a day? 3,600 gallons a day. Sorry, Jimmy, but for my mental sanity, I need to convert it back to civilized units. 3,600 gallons equals 13,627 liters a day. Better. Better. Good. So, if 100 wells provide water to 500,000 people, that means that each well is designed for 5,000 people. 13,627 liters a day divided by 5,000 people makes 2.7 liters per person and per day. The usual health advice for women is to drink 2 liters a day and for men 2.5 liters a day. So thanks to this philanthropy, these communities will have their drinking water needs covered. And that's awesome. But it won't be nearly enough for laundry, showering, which is suggested in B-roll or agricultural uses. Generally speaking, the World Health Organization and the United Nations convened to define the human rights right to save fresh water for drinking, cooking and cleaning to be 50 liters per day and per person. And that's the bottom of the range. They explicitly say 50 to 100 liters per person and per day. Although a city enters a day zero event when it goes under 50, so I take that as a reference. I'm not saying or implying that Jimmy is lying here at all. For instance, when he shows this well, that's apparently drilled for agricultural purposes. But there as well, I'm pretty sure the water goes to feeding the livestock, not irrigating the crops. In a nutshell, these 100 wells will provide half a million people with the water they need to cover their drinking needs all year long, not more, but it's already a massive improvement compared with their starting point. The last element of the video I'd like to highlight is this sentence Mr. Beast has towards the end of the video when he says, I know it's weird that a YouTuber has to do all this stuff, but someone's got to do it. And if no one else is, we're going to do it. Jimmy is almost apologizing and justifying himself for doing something that's truly awesome. Yet he says it right earlier in the video. You would think that having an effect of this magnitude would require the resources and funding of a large government, but that's not true. Solving this problem is possible. It doesn't need the resources of governments to change these communities' lives. And luckily so, governments and international institutions have a track record of failing to enforce this population's right to save water. And it's awesome to see Mr. Beast step in. If that sounds weird to some, it's probably because they don't know who's the person who single-handedly did the most to improve access to water over the past decade worldwide, together with his co-founder Gary White at water.org. Would you guess who I'm referring to? Well, you might have seen him in Saving Private Ryan or in the well-titled Rainmaker or simply know him as Jason Bourne. Indeed, you reckon it right? It's Matt Damon. Since 2009, water.org has enabled over 50 million people to gain sustainable access to safe water, especially through their water credit initiative. That's the path Mr. Beast is following and he started with a bang and half a million lives changed. I'm no expert, but from what I read, Beast philanthropy is praised to be a serious place in all endeavors it's taking on, which is why, as I mentioned in the opening, we've taken a family decision with my daughters to participate in the fundraising, and the link is still in the description if you want to do the same. I raised some questions about Mr. Beast's approach in this video, yet I would believe that all my concerns have been taken care of by Jimmy's team. It just wasn't a fit for his 207 million subscribers to go in the bit more details I went here today, but my last video did 30 views or so, so I guess I can afford to be boring. <laughs> Mr. Beast also provided anyone with a contact to raise questions in his own video, so I sure emailed his team to check if they'd be keen to share more details on their project. Of course, because I'd be super happy to endorse their approach toward my own contacts within the investment fund slash philanthropy word, but also sub-saran water utilities and water companies. They haven't responded yet, but that's entirely normal given the success of their video and how small of a confetti I am in that ocean of queries they probably received. If they reach back, I'll sure make an update video to follow track. If you don't want to miss out or if what I shared today was genuinely interesting to you, I discuss water topics on that channel on a almost weekly basis, so consider liking and subscribing. And if you want to understand why I believe that Mr. Beast or Matt Damon will do much more to quench the world's thirst than United Nations, check out this video and I'll see you next time.